Professor Lawrence von Seidlein. He's Professor of Global Health at the Nuffield Department of Medicine at Oxford University and has been here in Bangkok for several years. He's, um, his focus is on uh, uh, malaria elimination in the Greater Mekong subregion, and he has led several projects here um, with a with the focus, especially uh, on, uh, for example, targeted malaria elimination, um, what, whatever the latest uh, acronym for that is, right? So um, uh, he will give us uh, a perspective now on the current uh, current panorama of drug resistance in the region. So thank you very much, Lawrence. Okay, so um, I was asked to give an overview and there are two problems. One of them is that you have to select certain things that you want to talk about. And that is of course subjective. So uh, some people will say, well, you really got this wrong or you forgot this and so on. But I mean, you have only half an hour. So if you look back over all the things you have this subjective impression that I'm going to give you and I apologize for that first thing. Um, yeah. Okay, um, overview, starting with the past. I want to talk quickly about chloroquine resistance, then about sulfadoxin pyramethamine resistance and following by artemisinin resistance. So that's the past. And then what do we learn from that? Then I would like to talk a little bit about changes in first-line treatments. Uh, and that leads to preventing to the spread of antimalarial resistance. And one of the approaches to do this was mass drug administrations. The first one was targeting high-risk uh, populations like forest workers. And then the other one that we are doing now is uh, mass vaccination and drug administrations. Okay, starting off with chloroquine resistance, and uh, this is a slide. That, uh, so that's that would be pilin, and then it uh, the, it's thought to be jumping, or it's reported in India, and from there it's reported in East Africa, then Central Africa, and then in the 1990s it's reported in West Africa. So. Looking back at this slide that we always accept as this is the, the, the natural the evolvement of uh, the evolution of and spread of chloroquine resistance, the question is, of course, what happened in other places. So if you show this to a historian, they immediately ask, so what happened in, the, uh, in, in this place and in this place and in this place? And uh, I have to admit that I really don't know. And I don't think there were a lot of these TES treatment efficacy studies at the time. So. Um, at the time, in the 1990s, there were three big fallacies in people working in malaria. And basically, when you worked in a place like the Gambia in 1995, you were told when you treat malaria patients with chloroquine, they, they, they clear their parasites, which was obviously not true because there was resistance at the time. And then the second big fallacy was when you don't treat malaria patients, they stay sick and they probably die which was obviously evidently wrong because malaria had been wrong for 10,000 years and people had not died from malaria. And then came the worst one, which was malaria patients who have persistent parasitemia or malaria on chloroquine treatment don't adhere to their treatment, which is really blaming the victim because we gave them the wrong treatment and of course it didn't have any uh, big effect on them. So then we are coming to sulfadoxin pyrimethamine and that's a combination therapy, two drugs which had been around for more than 10 years before, before they were combined. And there were two mutations, one of them in DHPS and the other one in DHFR. And that was first described here again in one place, which is called Pai, around Pailin, Thai Cambodian border again. And that one again jumped to East Africa, supposedly jumping over India, if I understand this correctly, or wasn't reported there. And then from there to Central Africa. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't spread to West Africa because it was clear 
that it, this, this drug was basically dead on arrival um, because there was a re already resistance by the time it was introduced in East Africa. And so it wasn't introduced in the other places. So one of the consequences of that is that here there was chloroquine treatment was first line drug and it stayed the first line drugs th throughout the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. Okay, and then we come to the big change in first line treatment, which is the ACTs, the uh, artemisinin combination therapies. And here the interesting thing is, which you may know or may not know, is that the first of these combination therapies was really developed by the Academy of Military Science in Beijing. And uh, at that time, there was a collaboration with Sipa Geigi based in Basel in Switzerland. And I think the interest for, for me, it was very interesting to, to learn that uh, these, this collaboration happened for one reason, and that was the uh, Chinese market was opening up for, for the pharmaceutical industry. And so basically, Sipa Geige wanted to enter the Chinese market, and the only way they could do this was by making a collaborative agreement. And then so Sipa Geige asked, so which drug do you have that you want us to introduce in the West, or maybe it was the other way around that Beijing said, look, you have to introduce one of our drugs in the West. And so they agreed on Artemisa Lumefantrin. So it was strictly for commercial reasons, really, that this uh, drug was developed and uh, put through the regulatory pathway. Um, mm -hmm. Then Siba Geigi combined with Sando and became Novartis, and this is now the core Artemisa that we are having. And today, 70% of the treatments for uncomplicated malaria are, of course, still co-artemisa. Um, the interesting other aspect of this uh, development was that I showed you that chloroquine resistance had was thoroughly established by the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But it took the WHO until 2004, 2006, until it recognized ACTs. During that time, one of the persons who uh, really worked on this, uh, helping Siba Geigi, promoting the uh, ACTs, particularly Coartemisolumefantrin, was, of course, Nick White, who is working still to this day, working here in, in Bangkok, in Moro with us. And... Um, Siba Geige didn't have a lot of experience with antimalarials and hadn't developed antimalarials before. So Nick White played an absolutely vital role in uh, showing Siba Geige how this drug could be uh, used and uh, his contacts in Africa allowed this rollout of, uh, of Coartemisa. The, the other problem that you should see from this is, okay, so if you have resistance in the 1990s, and you know that you have a drug against it, the, the artemisinins, it took more than 10 years until it was recognized here by the WHO. And if any one of you is wondering why there is so much animosity between some malariologists and the WHO, this is a very good place to start because millions have died during that 10-year period, which was totally unnecessary. Okay, now artemisinin resistance started then or was first reported in 2008. Of course, it was around a little bit earlier, and there were treatment efficacy studies in 2003, 2004 in the region, Cambodian Thai border around here, this area, again, Pai Lin. And then in 2008, I think the first report came from Harald Nödel. Then Arjen Dondorp reported the same uh, phenomenon that there was uh, some sort of um, artemisinin resistance. This, uh, then was followed by the observation that there was indeed multi-drug resistance. And this is the famous heart selective sweep reported in 2017, which really showed that there was a resistance strain going throughout the greater Mekong sub-region, touching on uh, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam. And um, for some people, that it was a public international health emergency. It definitely resulted in some international reaction. So there was some learning from chloroquine, from SP, and it really resulted in the Global Fund's Regional Artemisinin Resistance Initiative, right? 
and the Rye went through three rounds by now, as you may know. And anybody knows how much Global Fund invested into the three rounds of Rye. Can I get somebody from the audience telling me what the total amount is that they invested into this regional Artemisian resistance initiative? 100 million? Anybody for 100 million? Any takers for 500 million? No? 720 million dollars have been invested in the three rounds of Rye to deal with this uh, problem, basically. And um, the, the Rye initiative is one of the heads is Aryan Dondor, who's also based here in Bangkok, by the way, who has led this through the three rounds. Okay, so what happened then with Artemisian and resistance? And here we have the last slide that I showed you, and then basically 10 years pass until uh, 2017, first reports in Eritrea, 2018, first reports in Uganda of Artemisian and resistance. And the, the interesting thing here is, is that I don't have an arrow here. So this is an independent emergence of Artemisian. So you could say, well, Actually, you haven't achieved anything with your with your eye. But on the other hand, side, you said, yeah, well, we did achieve something because it looks different than the last times. Does it? I mean, this times it's not a spread; it's a new emergence of uh, of resistance strains. So it is some, something is different. And I would just would like to show you some more slides from Africa because it's very um, topical at the moment. So here was the uh, 2018. Um, outbreak in Eritrea. And this is the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And there's a smaller, um, what do you call it, of course, more epicenter maybe, here at the border between South Sudan and Ethiopia. And the strain is here R622i. So it is different from what we see in the uh, Thai-Cambodian area. And then the other epicenter is in Uganda. And there are now multiple places where um, the independent emergence of resistance strains has been reported. The strains here are C469Y and A675V. So something very different from what we see in Thai Cambodian areas and also different from what we see in Eritrea. There's also a, another epicenter here in Rwanda with R561H. And particularly worrying for me because I work in Tanzania in Kagera, that's uh, here between Lake Victoria and Rwanda. In Tanzania, there is also a place where there is uh, coartemisa resistance reported with uh, efficacies going down from more than 90% to less than 70%. So this is the latest. What is I found interesting, I was last week in Durban in South Africa and uh, the young people there who come, they just came from a meeting in Uganda, basically, and everybody's aware of what's going on. So 1995, Uganda, chloroquine resistance, it's kind of going under the radar. And now it is very clear that everybody's aware of what's going on here. And people talk about it. And for people who work on malaria, this is very much foremost on their mind, what's going on there. So big difference in a way. Oops. So. Um, how do we deal with, uh, with this resistance? Well, the first thing that we have to do is early diagnosis and treatment. And this only works as community health workers and community health workers are not very glamorous, but absolutely essential. This is health systems. And you need a lot of money to keep them working. And for people coming from Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, of course, they are very familiar with community health workers. This concept is not so familiar in Africa. And we have spent a lot of time trying to, un un trying to understand what's going on. Is, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are, of course, also community health workers, but usually they are paid by projects. And the project is over, they stop work. And so you have health centers, yes, but uh, not so much the community health workers in the sense that what we are working with in, in, in Cambodia. So that's a big difference. The other problem is that there are these HRP23 deletions, which necessitate changes in the uh, RTTs. 
essential for the early diagnosis. Thing. And if I can show you just here one picture, um, is here the studies that have been done. The gray ones are where no HRP2 was detected, and the orange ones is where HRP23 deletions have been detected. Um, so the problem with this picture is that it tells you this. If one has been detected, you get an orange dot, right? But what does that mean really in prevalence? How many of the strains that you have there um, are, have now these HRP2-3 deletions? And my understanding is that it's only in this part of uh, South America where it is so bad that it has to be changed. But interestingly, is when the first HRP2 deletions were reported in Tanzania, I know this because I worked there, um, the government immediately uh, outlawed basically um, the old HRP2 RDTs and has switched to combined HRP2 LDH uh, RDTs. So there's uh, the one big change which is going on at the moment. So what to do next? Of course, the knee jerk reaction is let's change the first line treatment. And um, there you would ideally like to switch from artemisinins to a new class of antimalarials great idea, but how to do it? And whoops, um, here we have the portfolio which I downloaded from uh, Medicines for Malaria Venture. So it is pretty state of the art what they are having in their pipeline. And you see a lot of promising candidates which could be used for uncomplicated malaria. The only problem with it is that there are only, I mean, looking through this, there are only really, there's really only one in late development, which is a new compound. And this is here, the Ghana Placid, for, again from Novartis. This is also known as CAF-156 and uh, is now usually called just Caflon. And that may become available for uncompli uh, uncomplicated malaria in the near future. The other three here that I highlighted, they're also here, um, or tried to highlight is they are a little bit further, but um, maybe it will take some time until they become available. The interesting thing here is that 10 years ago, when we started talking about artemisinin and resistance, we saw a similar slide and we were promised that in five years, we're going to have one. And then now it's more or less the same that when you go to these meetings with industrial representatives, they tell you in five years, we have one. So this five years is a very stretchable uh, time entity. What next? Then we have the triple therapies. And of course, that is something that Arjen Dondorp and his group here, we have Chanaki, a representative who is working on this and Mehu Dorda. The three of them are very intensely working on triple therapies. And there are basically two candidates, Artemisa Lumefantrin plus Amodiaquin. And interestingly, this has been picked up by Fosun and there will be a fixed drug combination. Actually, it already exists. It just has to go now through the regulatory process, but we have all seen these tablets, so they are there. And then the other one is artesanate mefloquine plus piperaquine. So these are the two triple therapies which are now in a very accelerated uh, process, hopefully will be licensed soon and can be used. And then what else can you do? Uh, ultimately, if you want to uh, stop the spread of antimalarial resistance, the only way you can do this is by eliminating malaria. And of course, that's also a big agenda item and a lot of people are working on this. Um, so for current prevention on malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, you can use insecticide treated bed nets. Fantastic, works very well, we know that, right? Um, the problem is that in Southeast Asia, insecticide treated bed nets are not as quite as promising because the vectors in Southeast Asia are outdoor biting, daytime biting. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the majority of malaria vectors are, it's a small, very small group. I mean, you have to appreciate this. There are only probably two or three species in Sub-Saharan Africa, which cause most of the, of the damage. In Southeast Asia, it's more than 20. So in the, the ones in Sub-Saharan Africa, indeed, they are indoor biting and nighttime biting. So having a bed net really protects you. 
Um, the other strategy which has become more popular is chemo prevention and there is seasonal malaria chemo prevention which originally was thought only for the Sahel because there's really seasonal malaria and only for children under five years of age. So they're becoming a little bit promiscuous with, uh, with chemo prevention. And now older children up to 12 years or maybe even school children up to 16 are included in these programs. And it is no longer just for the Sahel, it is also for places which have multiple, se multiple seasons or even pain with malaria. So this is a strategy which millions, tens of millions of children are benefiting from. But it is strictly focused for one age group. So overall, it will not do much for uh, elimination. And then um, coming to Southeast Asia, again, here insecticide treated bed nets, great stuff. Of course, you want to use them, but they are not doing much for malaria. They are good for other nuisance bugs and other, other problems, but um, they are, don't have a big impact on malaria. And so that's more than 10 years ago, the, we did these large studies from our stock administration that was led by, again, Nick White and Francois Nossi. Um, so what we did for mass drug administrations, I'm sorry for boring you because most of you, of course, have participated in these studies or thank you very much, Dr. Nien. Um, here, the idea was that we had three rounds of three days, uh, dehydroartemisinin, piperaquin, or cigalodulus primaquin. That was given at months zero, one, and two. And then we did uh, cross-sectional surveys every three months over a year. And at the end of it, we did crossover uh, treatments in the control villages. And so what we were hoping would be was that the malaria transmission would collapse and stay down. But what happened actually was here, if I can show you this here on the x-axis are the months, on the y-axis is the prevalence that we detect. The red line are the control villages. And yes, it goes down a little bit in the control villages as well. And then finally here in the intervention villages, we see what we wanted to see. It goes down from 5% collapses completely and is very close to zero. And if it would have stayed there, we would have been happy, but this didn't happen in most of the villages. In the hands of very, uh, what you call, well-organized places, like for example, around Mesot, in the hands of somebody like uh, Francois Nosten and his team, it stayed down, but in the other places, if you're not very careful, it goes up again. So the re reality is that after three months or something like this, there's re-importation of malaria after the mass drug administration. And so we are coming now to the idea is what else can we do for, for, for prevention? And here the idea is that there are now two malaria vaccines that are licensed. Um, the first one was RTSS, which I showed down here. And the other one, which is more attractive, is R21 Matrix M. So um, R21 is the antigen, Matrix M is the adjuvant, and it is based on the circumspored uh, protein. Both of these vaccines, RTSS and R21, uh, use the circumspored pro circumsporozoid protein as the antigen. And this is a representation of this uh, circumsporozoid protein. And a fragment of this is combined with an hepatitis surface antigen. Oops. Sorry. Here. And in the case of RTSS, it's dominantly or the majority of the molecules are hepatitis S surface antigen. So hepatitis surface antigen. And I try to show this here in this figure. So the blue lines here, the blue wiggles here, is meant to be the hepatitis surface antigen, hepatitis B surface antigen. And these uh, beans here are the circumsporozoid protein. And clearly, there is a majority of hepatitis, sur hepatitis B surface antigen. And that is why RTSS is probably the best hepatitis B vaccine that you can get. But it is not particularly immunogenic against malaria. And based on this, so RTSS is now also 30 years in development. And based on this idea, the colleagues in Oxford, Adrian Hill and Katie Collins, took this up and actually it was Katie Collins's PhD project to develop, to fine tune this molecule here, the RTSS molecule. 
And what they did is they did a different uh, process. And using that, they attach much more of these CSPs on the outside of this uh, HP surface antigen. And then you have a vaccine, which is called R21. The RTSS, the adjuvant for it is, uh, um, is AS01, which is, uh, belongs to GSK, is therefore not available for other companies or other vaccines, or is unlikely to become available for other vaccines. So they combined it with uh, Matrix M from Novavax. And the um, efficacy of this vaccine is quite satisfactory. So it's uh, about 77% uh, at month six and 80% uh, at month 12 after the booster. And so with 80%, we have something, right? With RTSS, the way it was evaluated, there are a lot of, uh, and, and, and you can talk easily for an hour, the differences in the evaluation of R21 and RTSS. But now with R21, we have a vaccine which after 12 months has uh, an acceptable protection. But the really important thing about it is that it is available. So RTSS is produced by GSK and GSK in its generosity has said they're going to make up to 10 million doses available by um, in the next uh, two years, if we are really lucky. Now, this is a vaccine which sh should be used in Sub-Saharan Africa and other malaria endemic regions. There are 1.3 million people living in Africa today. And if only 10% of them want four doses of this vaccine, we need 500 million doses of vaccine. And so with RTSS, there's not even a start. And of course, WHO immediately jumped into the breach and said, OK, let's ration it. So we make a rationing plan. Fantastic. We have meetings on rationing of vaccines, which I find personally deeply disgusting um, that you just say, OK, we are deciding now you get it, you don't get it, you get it, you don't get it. So it's, it's basically another health disaster. So the advantage of R21, the really big advantage is not just that it's maybe better or more protective. The really big advantage is that it is now produced by the Serum Institute of India. And uh, Serum Institute of India is the world's largest vaccine manufacturer by number of doses produced and sold globally. And uh, Serum Institute of India, you may have heard now because during the COVID outbreak, of course, they produced monthly between two and 300 million doses of COVID vaccine. So for them, the business is not making a lot of money from a single vial, but making money by scale. And that is for something like a malaria vaccine, absolutely essential. So there is a real chance that enough malaria vaccine will be available for Sub-Saharan Africa as well as for malaria elimination efforts in Asia and South America. How can it be used, uh, a, a malaria vaccine, if you don't have, you know, so many people and maybe there's a reluctance in the population to use a malaria vaccine because they say, well, we don't have malaria. So um, what we are trying to do here in Bangladesh, and this is our last or latest effort, and why Bangladesh? Because there are only very few focal areas of falciparum malaria left. There's low transmission. The government is determined to eliminate malaria. And if you are in that position, you have to use your new tools. You have no choice, right? So what do they do is um, the regulatory environment is now in favor of novel interventions to interrupt malaria transmission. And what we want to do here, and this is one of my last slides, so apologies that it is a little bit complex. We want to do a trial with um, four arms. So it's a factorial design. One of them is the combination of mass drug administration, the same way we did it before 10 years ago with the same drug regimen, but now we add to it the R21 uh, matrix M. Then we have an arm with MDA only, an arm with vaccine only, and control villages to show what the baseline is at the moment. And then we can determine what the incremental benefits are. If you only use vaccine, if you only use MDA, and if you use a combination. And we are hoping that there's a synergistic effect because we saw this in the combination of RTSS combined with uh, seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis, there seems to be synergism. So we have real hope that by using these two interventions combined, that we have a certain amount of synergism and make real progress for the first time towards uh, malaria elimination. The um, the big thing is, and I think that should be still about half the, the, the page, 
is community engagement because these interventions only work if the population buys into it and wants to participate. So half of the budget and more than half of the time goes into community engagement throughout the process. Then we hope to detect cases with passive case detection and also do uh, cross-sectional surveys um, twice a year. So in summary, what I'm trying to say, or what I was trying to say over the last half hour is that we have present problems and we try to tackle these problems by looking in the past. Um, and there, are, there, there were big differences between chloroquine, the first of these resistance, antimalarial resistance and spreads, and then uh, SP, which was a combination. So it also com in, in itself, some, something was different. And um, finally, artemisinin and resistance, which again is a completely different story. But ultimately, we have to learn here from what happened to be able to address these problems in the future and find new approaches towards uh, controlling this, this problem. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, big overview of uh, where we were and where we are. And I, I mean, I think the message that comes out very clearly is, uh, you know, that you really have to use all the tools in your arsenal to to get to that last mile of elimination. That's that's an important message. Um, I think we can take uh, uh, a couple of questions. Um, anybody there? Yes, please stay. Hi, I just had a couple of questions. One is, uh, one thing you didn't mention was multiple first line therapies. Is that something that you think is, is useful in mitigating the spread of artemisinin in resistance? So, so having multiple first line therapies available in country rather than just triple therapy. And then the second thing is the concern about uh, there's only one drug in late clinical development, and that appears to include an artemisinin derivative. So, um, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> um, so, this the switching between uh, first line treatments, it is surprisingly difficult to do. I don't know what your experience is with this, but um, th that was actually before coming up with the idea of triple therapies. I think most national malaria control programs automatically do that. They go try to switch from one to the next, to the next, to the next, which is, it is just incredibly difficult to do because you have, um, to have to remove the stock from one, bring in a new one. Then you have to do the training. You have to explain people what you're doing, why you are doing it. And, um, that costs a lot of money and a lot of time. And that was, I mean, for, for me, when I heard this first, and it was about 20 years ago when they did this in CIR in Kenya, it was a huge effort to do it. And I think it, for everybody, I mean, ideally somebody from a malaria control program should answer this question. Why it is so difficult to switch from one uh, first line treatment to the other. That's so, and then for how long does it work, right? Uh, in Cambodia, I think this is the current strategy to have switched from one to the next, to the next. Okay, and the next question was? Uh, it, it was, well, I, I guess the thing with multiple first line therapies is having two or three drugs available in country so that the parasite isn't exposed just to a AL, for example. Yeah. Uh, so so that, that would be that would be the idea rather than doing switch, 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 sequential switch, I think. Yeah, then you have in one health center three different first line treatments and that can lead to endless confusion because, for example, Coartemisa has a different schedule than other ones. And so it is difficult. It, it from from our perspective, or from a from a hospital in the in in San Francisco, it's it's relatively easy because you have these things in your pharmacy, and the nurses know how to prescribe them, and it works. In real life, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it is exceedingly difficult, and it leads just to continuous stock It basically is chaos. Yeah. Okay. And then the second concern I had was the fact that the MMV drug. Um, there, there seems to be only one drug in uh, clinical development, and that has lumefantrin as part of it. Um, and obviously, AL is 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 the first line therapy in Africa. So the, uh, the coffee. yeah, Keflum. So, are there any concerns about uh, putting all, yeah lumefantrin resistance? Yeah, how much do we know about lumefantrin resistance? Um, 
I think that's a question that here this round can probably answer more competently than I can. It doesn't seem to be a big concern at the moment, but uh, of course it has been reported already. Right? Who is um, the I lumefantrin think... specialist? Maybe Malika can tell us something about uh, lumefantrin resistance. I, I think there's no the, there's no definitive um, evidence of lumefantrin resistance. There's there's a there's some evidence of variation of sensitivity, but uh, I I'm not aware uh, that really there has there has been reported resistance. It's a it's an incredibly resilient uh, drug. I think. I mean, Laos, for instance, uh, who use uh, coatum, and they are the only uh, country in uh, in the Eastern GMS, um, have actually, I think, been very well served by the drug, and it still doesn't seem. I mean, you still have some variations, right? But do you do you have uh, uh, do you think you have resistance to to lumefantrin, Doctor Kyo? Yeah, from Lao, we use a uh, first line treatment AL past uh, PQs single dose, but right now uh, we are not yet analysis for the lumefantin, but we send uh, sample to uh, laboratory already. We are waiting the list now. Yes, but for the uh, artemisinin, like uh, we found that. K13, but less than uh, 50%. Yeah, but for AL, the we conclusion the high efficacy right now. So I think we can say that there is a, everybody is nervous about it. I mean, we are all very well aware that there is a possibility that lumefantrin resistance will pop up and spread very, very quickly. It hasn't happened over 30 okay. years, and that's why they're still using it. Okay, what do you think? But I think, yeah, there were those small studies from Cambodia, I can't remember, 2003, was it? So there were there was a, a study that was done where the efficacy was quite low, I think 80% or so, and then it was repeated because people were worried or maybe people didn't absorb the drug, and it was confirmed again. I think the concern at that time that it might have been related to very high PFMDR1 because mefloquine had been used, but I think that was there's been this fear I think over the last twenty years because of the, those um, those failures in those studies in Cambodia. So, so there there has been documented uh, treatment failure in the past. Um, you want to say something? Question for Professor. Uh, I we. Yeah. Um, so in Vietnam now we in the last mile of uh, elimination stage. So I'm so interested in uh, you. So in Bangladesh, you you the uh, MDA uh, with uh, also vaccine. So um, my question is, um, how the cost of the vaccine? I think you you uh, are twenty one. In, in Bangladesh for um, uh, vaccine, right? Not the same in Bangladesh, so it's high for us. Um, it's, it's agreed to sell it for, I understand now, $3 a dose. Um, yeah. this, this the final so then of course, is um, four times three, twelve dollars Yeah, so... Uh, we, we, that's three, four, even four vaccines, three doses plus a booster. Yeah, so um, in Bangladesh, how big, how large a population you apply for that and for how long? And which uh, kind of drug for MDA? So what we are planning to do is 10,000 people in 100 villages and have uh, 25 villages with e in each arm. Mm -hmm. And we are going to do it um, over three months, the first round of vaccination. So from one to three, mm -hmm. and then before the next rainy season, we do the booster, which can be between 8 and 12 months after the last uh, dose, basically. So it's over a year. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
We have time for one last one, if there's anybody. Can I ask one then, please? Um, so it, it seems that the biggest problem in the Eastern GMS, in my view, has been actually that at one time, uh, it, resistance emerged to DHAP paraquin and all the neighboring countries were using this this drug. And I, I think to me, the, the, the sort of most worrying thing about the situation in Uganda, Rwanda, et cetera, is they're all using AL. And so now the pressure is on the partner drug. Um, what, what about is, rather than just changing drug, but, you know, asking country, neighboring countries to, to use different drugs, for instance? Yeah, it would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? I, I'm, I was hoping that this, the situation, because it, there are obviously similarities. If you look at the borders between Thailand, Cambodia, that we are dealing with here, and then you look Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, it's, it's a very similar setup, isn't it? And there is something to be learned, I think, and, and you can use there. Of course, then the, the beginnings are different because they really are mostly using uh, uh, co-artemisin. So yes, it's probably a good idea to, to start thinking about doing something. But I think the other pro big problem in Africa is that the transmission is so much higher than it is in the, in, in the GMS. So uh, trying to eliminate malaria in these areas is really a much, an even huger challenge than it is for us here in the, in, in the GMS. But I mean, you have to start at some place and now you have a vaccine. So, I mean, if I had something to say, I would very rapidly try to roll out this vaccine as intense as I can uh, and try to bring the transmission down. And then based on that, do these switches in, in therapy and probably um, using triple therapy is then the most uh, promising approach at, at this stage. Okay, well, can we thank again uh, Professor Ponsideline, who 